Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this event on uh, vaccines. Um, I will shortly hand, hand you over to our chair, Professor Claire Heffernan, who's the director of LIDC. But first, I'd just like to uh, give you some practical information. Um, can I ask you to please keep your microphone muted while our speakers are, are presenting? Um, if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat or at, towards the end of the event, we'll, um, uh, you can raise your hand. There should be a little uh, blue hand um, in the menu that you can raise your hand that way. Um, and yeah, um, I will now hand over to, to Claire who will introduce the speakers. Okay, thank you. And, and welcome everyone to our webinar on vaccines ending the pandemic in a world plagued by rumors and skepticism. And I just thought I'd say it just a few brief moments before we introduce our speakers. Um, I think we'd all agree that vaccine hesitancy is really one of the defining issues of our time. I mean, so much so that WHO in 2019 declared vaccine hesitancy among the top 10 global health threats. And, and now we're in our centennial global pandemic and in addition to all the elements that inform the delivery of vaccines from the supply chain to the cold chains, it's public perception of these vaccines that seem to be making the most headlines. So how did we get here? How did we get to this place where responding to rumors and skepticism and misinformation is arguably as important as the development and delivery of these vaccines themselves? So we have two very global voices with us today to, to, to guide us through different perspectives on vaccine hesitancy. And I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Heidi Larson, uh, many, many of you know Heidi and her work. She's the Professor of Anthropology, Risk and Decision Science at LSHTM. She's also the founding director of the Vaccine Confidence Project. She was previously head of Global Immunization Communication at UNICEF, and she served on the WHO SAGE Working Group on Vaccine Hesitancy. Uh, her, Heidi's research focuses on the analysis of social and political factors affecting the uptake of health interventions and technologies. And her particular focus is on risk and rumor management in health programs and technologies and, and building public trust. So if you get a chance, I would strongly encourage you to read Heidi's recent work. Uh, in her vast frontline experience, she's gonna tell us about why do people believe these vaccine rumors? Welcome, Heidi. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to try to get my um, my slide deck open here. It was just open a minute ago. It's a lively time to um, be talking about rumors with all the um, <laughs> circulating pieces of information and misinformation. I'll just um, share my screen. I share. Do you see a title slide? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I just want to start by saying uh, this issue is not new. Um, uh, the issue of rumors and concerns about vaccines in particular. Uh, this has been an issue since the very first uh, smallpox vaccine uh, in the 1800s. And uh, to some, it was a delusion. Um, I was struck uh, in uh, October last year when I saw a covered story, big feature, oops, in the, in time, in the Times um, that was talking about uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, turning people into monkeys. Uh, it was a story that was um, a kind of a breaking story about an investigation into a, a Russian um, anti-vaccine uh, scam that was trying to undermine the vaccine. But it reminded me of the vaccine monster from the 1800s feeding a monster children. Um, and it was, and in the background there is a sort of truth and some people challenging um, this whole vaccine uh, effort. Um, but there, was, there were also a lot of images of people turning into cows 
um, because of they were vaccinated. Well, vaccine comes from vodka, cow, from the smallpox vaccine. Um, so this animal imagery was quite fascinating. Uh, even the term fake news was not uh, in recent times. This goes back to the 1800s also. Um, so I just to put this in context, um, it travels differently than it used to, but it's been with us. It's part of human nature, it seems. Uh, in Boston, around the Second World War, uh, there were a lot of rumors then because uh, people wondering about their fathers, brothers, husbands, and sons who were across the ocean in Europe um, and not knowing enough about not having the kind of communication we have now. So uh, the wisdom was to set up a rumor clinic. And once a week, people would, people would send in their letters to the Boston Herald with the rumors they had heard. And once a week, a rumor was featured with it debunked. Um, now, just think about debunking one rumor a week in the current environment. This is different. Um, this is uh, a map of 100 million um, Facebook user groups uh, moving fast. This uh, was uh, published in Nature. Um, and this is a colleague I collaborate with uh, at uh, George Washington University. Um, and basically, the blue uh, groups are pro-vaccine. The red is anti. Uh, and these are communities of people, and the green are the undecided. And what they saw was even though um, there were 124 uh, pro-vaccine communities, their numbers were much larger within those communities, uh, there was a much larger group of anti-vaccine groups, even with smaller numbers. But what they did was they splintered to respond and be responsive to as many different concerns as people had, rather than a more homogenous um, uh, messaging that missed a lot of the diversity in the questions. What it meant was that the anti-vaccine groups are, are, this is real time, recruiting uh, the undecided people at a rate 500% times faster than the pro-groups we've got a problem. The context to the current uh, vaccine uh, rumors and challenges in the context of COVID, this is not brand new. There's a background of anti-vaccine uh, movements, as, as I mentioned, back to the 1800s. But um, in, in Europe, uh, around the measles vaccine, uh, we had you know, over 80,000 cases of measles across the EU in 2017, 2018 which prompted uh, Italy and France, uh, among others, to increase their uh, vaccine requirements for school, but it provoked a lot of reaction. This is in the US for a mix of other reasons. What I like about this slide, not necessarily the, the reality of it, but the fact that it captures everything from liberty to money-making, to medical tyranny, to um, uh, vaccine risks. Um, it captures many dimensions. What I find concerning is these parents are putting children on the front lines, putting children out there. This is in Indonesia with posters. Um, Go to hell with your vaccine. That's clearly for an international journalist. Um, but this is kind of, um, kind of a manipulative aspect of it that is particularly concerning. As Claire mentioned, WHO named, it was actually what they named was vaccine hesitancy, not anti-vaccine movement, which is a common and unfortunate mixing up. But um, as one of the top 10 health threats, I wrote in 2018 in a, in a nature commentary that my prediction was that one of the biggest pandemic risks was gonna be viral misinformation, not expecting that it would come along as quickly as it did. Uh, since we've uh, been into COVID, there's been a number of, I mean, our own analysis of global media monitoring uh, around vaccines in general, but we've repurposed that to really uh, particularly pay attention to COVID-related conversations. 
um, uh, this just is a BMJ article talking about one in four of the YouTube COVID-19 videos um, were misleading, misinformation, uh, and we see an, an explosive uh, increase in the anti and questioning sentiments since COVID started. Um, I often get the question, uh, well, does it really matter? Is it just a lot of noise or is it impacting on people? So we did a, a control trial, 4,000 people in the US, 4,000 in the UK. Uh, for 1,000 in each country, we gave them straightforward factual information. And in uh, both countries, we exposed them to five of the most frequently uh, circulating pieces of misinformation online. We interviewed everyone before about their COVID experience in general, including would they take a COVID vaccine? And 54% in the UK said they would definitely take the vaccine, 41% in the UK, I mean, sorry, in the US. But after the, uh, for those who saw the positive um, information, the factual information had zero change. Um, they didn't get any more motivated to take the vaccine and it didn't, at least it didn't discourage them. But for those who had seen the misinformation, it caused an over a six percentage point drop in people's willingness to take a vaccine. This does matter. We have to pay attention to it. But it's not all about misinformation. It's also about doubt and distrust. One of my concerns is what I think is almost a disproportionate focus on misinformation and fact checking um, and not taking into account the, the broader environment and the roots of what's driving the belief in a lot of this misinformation. And this is not just online. Um, uh, we are seeing a, a propagation of offline. I mean, some of these anti-groups are going offline, particularly as there's more and more restrictions online. This is in Romania saying vaccines are not safe, know the risks. This was in, in Italy, the risk of mandatory vaccine um, and it's, it's publics for no mandates. And in, in New Zealand, if you knew the ingredients, would you risk it? And this is also with an Aboriginal um, a, a father. So it's trying to reach different communities. And what it's doing is not, they're not putting illegal misinformation out there. They're provoking questions. And this is also one of the challenges. Uh, I have a lot of conversations with Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google uh, in, their in their efforts to try to rein in some of this um, uh, mis and, and disinformation, but there's a much bigger body of things that are just instilling doubt. And that's much harder to certainly to take down, but even to contain. Um, distrust uh, it can be quite emotional and strong, and we've seen its negative impact. Um, the serious distrust uh, in Guinea when the Ebola uh, pandemic struck, um, when people started coming in with these, you know, covered uh, so that people couldn't recognize them and then taking sick family members away and bringing them back in black bags. I mean, it was, it, it, there were health, um, part of the health teams that were coming, uh, were killed. Um, in, in Pakistan, um, polio workers have been killed nine in one day a few years ago. And there've been over a over hundred between uh, Pakistan and, and more in Afghanistan and Northern Nigeria. That's the level of distrust and anger uh, and resent about a number of different issues, not about the safety of the vaccine, not about misinformation distrust in government, distrust in international figures, um, and, and in some cases in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan, the fact that women were giving vaccines when they should be in their house, which is the cultural dimension of some of this. Denialism is also a, a feature in, has in a number of past pandemics um, and is certainly uh, a, a driving uh, issue in some of the conspiracies and denialism um, in the context of um, COVID. 
Uh, this was uh, AIDS. I, this is one of my favorite posters, but it said it all. Uh, Ebola, I mean, one part of the campaign was to say, this is real. This is real. Um, because there was a lot of people, particularly in the West Africa outbreak, where it had not been before in, in DR Congo, it had been there for 40 years. It, people knew that it existed. But when it uh, broke out in Guinea and Liberia um, uh, and Sierra Leone, they, they thought it was somebody else's um, virus and this was multi created. Um, and this is a similar thing that's come up in COVID. COVID is a hoax. This was in, in London on the left. Uh, COVID is a lie. Um, that was in the US and then Bolsonaro. Um, and some of the, what's concerning is when leaders have the denialism that leads to uh, not getting interventions um, that are needed and, and resulting in people dying. Where is the pandemic? Uh, people um, questioning, you know, we don't see it. It's not tangible. And if people don't believe a virus exists, why would they think that the question of whether they would take a vaccine or not is not even relevant anymore? Why would you even think about that if you don't believe the virus is real? Uh, this is in Tanzania. Um, the leader who ultimately died of COVID was in a lot of denial about the state of COVID, he um, uh, and instilled that the will of God would come and take care of people, and he had many followers um, behind him. Uh, we did a 15-country study in collaboration with Africa CDC, and in our results, the top five of the top five, the second highest one was, I don't believe the virus exists. Um, I haven't seen it. Um, and some of the other, what really struck me is, um, these top five, I don't trust the vaccine. I don't believe it exists. I'm concerned about the safety. I don't feel I'm at risk and I don't have enough information. This could be anywhere in the world. We often think of risk um, in, in our scientific context. I mean, we're hearing a lot about risk with the uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine risks that have been reported and more recently the J&J &J vaccine. Um, and we think of it with reason, with logic, with benefit and risk, but we think of it from a technical scientific point of view. But from a public point of view, this is about feelings. This is about um, fear. This is about anxiety. Sometimes it's about anger of, a, of when there is a risk and why didn't you tell us sooner? Um, it's about politics. And sometimes there are real risks. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, and anyone who reads the newspaper has seen um, that uh, AstraZeneca uh, had, in the last couple of days, stopped their uh, rollout completely of AstraZeneca. And now J and J, uh, a new risk uh, identified. It's a similar platform uh, with adenovirus as the AstraZeneca vaccine, but they're investigating um, it further. But these kinds of things, it's not just about misinformation. What do you do when there are real risks? How do you contain them? And one of the most important things is to get back to the public clearly. I mean, one comment I was making about the J&J &J halt, uh, and Tony Fauci said, this will be a pause. Well, if you keep it at a pause, that's okay, but then be clear. But when a pause becomes weeks and months, that is an absolute fertile ground for rumors, misinformation, and alternative narratives to thrive. I'll end with a, a positive effort, which is one of my favorites in the various ones I've uh, been working with or, or learned of. Team Halo uh, and London was one of the three, I mean, UK was one of the three countries where it was piloted, UK, India, and Brazil. A, a group of young scientists, uh, healthcare providers, getting online, getting on TikTok, being there to answer questions quickly, promptly. And also you get to know these, uh, these guides as they're called not just in their lab, not just in the healthcare setting, but going home, buying a Christmas tree, doing things that make them relatable to um, the lives of, of the public.
Um, and it's really, it's jumped onto a number of platforms. It's really a, a fantastic effort. And I think one of the most valuable things about it is that answers are relevant to the public's questions, which one of the biggest concerns that public ha publics have is, oh, I went to that official website, but it didn't have the answers to my questions. This is an effort to have answers to the real questions that people have. And only when we're there quickly are we gonna mitigate the spread of misinformation and rumors. This is my book, Stuck, which can tell you a lot more about how vaccine rumors start and why they don't go away. And this is our website where you can find more data. Thanks so much. Thanks, Heidi, that was really great. Thank you for that. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, Dr. Jonathan Kennedy. And uh, Jonathan is a senior lecturer in global public health at Queen Mary. He's director of the MSC in global health in public, MSC Global Public Health Program. And his research is focused on the intersection between politics and infectious diseases. And in the last few years, he's focused on the drivers of vaccine hesitancy and his recent work, which I would encourage you all to find and read, he's explored a link between populist politics and vaccine hesitancy in Europe and equally, some, he explores some of the broader impacts of this breakdown in trust uh, between science and the political context of vaccine hesitancy. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Claire. And also thank you to Heidi for such a fascinating talk. It's, um, it's a pretty difficult act to follow one of the, the world authorities on vaccine confidence, but I'm gonna do that by trying to really broaden um, the discussion and look at some of the historical, um, political, social context of vaccine hesitancy. So let's take a big, big step backwards and just think about the relationship between viruses, bacteria, and humans to, to start with. Um, you know, if we begin at the beginning, the world um, is about four and a half billion years old. Um, bacteria and viruses have been around for at least three and a half billion years, maybe longer, and complex life only for a billion years. So, um, you know, if we, if we think about the way that humans evolved, they evolved to, to live with um, microbes, to live with bacteria and viruses. And that's the only way that complex life could could develop in this, in this environment. Um, so um, in many ways, humans are intruders in this age of microbes that's still, still going on. And we can, you know, there's all sorts of mind blowing statistics, you know, that we, we breathe in a hundred million viral particles every day. If you go to the sea and get a liter of seawater, there'll be a billion bacteria in, in that liter. Um, so being exposed to viruses and bacteria, it's not an exception. This is, really the, this is really the norm. And in fact, even our own bodies have more virus and bacteria particles than human, than human cells. And um, some of these microbes play really important roles in the way our bodies and even our minds function. Um, so I just wanted to start off with, with this. It might seem like it's coming from, from left field, but um, I think it's important to remember that finding a way to live in some kind of balance with bacteria and viruses is, um, it's really key to our survival on this planet, let alone development, however we want to define, define that. Um, sorry, I did have some, uh, I had some slides, but I, I forgot to put them up. I'll just take a pause and, um, and share them with you. In the excitement, I... Uh, Okay, so hopefully you can see that now. Um, sorry about that. You didn't miss anything, anything too exciting. Um, and the, the second point I wanted to make is that um, in many ways, epidemics are a product of, of development. Um, so, so again, to take a kind of really long view of, of history for something like 95, 96% of, of even Homo sapien history, we lived as hunter-gatherers and epidemic disease wasn't really a problem then. Um, it wasn't a problem until we took up 
settled farming. So beginning about 11 and a half thousand years ago in, um, in the fertile crescent. And when humans started living in close proximity to one another, to animals and also engaging in, in long distance trade, this is when epidemics became a, a problem. And this ushered in what the Egyptian born epidemiologist Abdul Omran has called the age of pestilence and famine. Um, so, so, so there was kind of um, people tended to tended to die early from infectious diseases, and it's only in the last couple of hundred years that we've seen a um, we've we've seen a move away from from this demographic pattern towards the age of receding pandemics. But it's important to to really kind of remember that that again, although COVID um, in some respects seems seems to have kind of come from from nowhere and has surprised lots of people. If we look back at history over the last few hundred years, it shouldn't be a surprise at all. People living in cities, people traveling long distances frequently, um, people interacting closely with animals um, tends to result in pretty, pretty horrible pandemics. So, um, so, so, so in many ways, what's happening now isn't an aberration, it's, um, it's a continuation of the, of the norm. Um, so the reason why we've seen a kind of um, improvement in public health over the last um, 100 years um, comes down to various advancements, but certainly vaccines are, are one of them. And if we, if we look even before the, the pandemic, the WHO suggested that, um, that vaccines saved between two and three million lives a year. And um, you know, now we have a COVID vaccine, we can we can multiply that that number by a factor of, 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 of several. So, um, you know, in many ways, vaccines are really one of the great, great um, inventions that humans have ever, ever, ever come across. Um, and in fact, if you look at kind of liberal optimists in the field of development, so people like Jeffrey Sachs, people like um, Hans Rosling or Bill Gates, they really kind of um, place vaccines on a pedestal and they see them um, as, as evidence of, um, of human progress and of, um, of, of, of our humans' ability to make their environment um, safer, for, for, safer and better for humans. Um, so if this is the case, if vaccines are such a great invention, which I believe they are, we have to answer this question, why is there so much vaccine hesitancy? Why um, are so many people skeptical of, of vaccines? Um, so, starting a, a couple of years ago, and in many ways inspired by reading Heidi's work on, on vaccine hesitancy and vaccine confidence, I started to wonder whether there was a link between um, political populism and vaccine hesitancy. And I, I began to think about this because there was some anecdotal data of so-called populist politicians who, who um, were spreading misinformation about vaccine safety. So, in the bottom left of the slide, you see this um, now notorious tweet from, from Donald Trump. Um, that was actually from 2014, so before he became president. Uh, but you also see in Italy um, with the Five Star Movement and the Liga, and also in France with what used to be the, um, the Front National, you see, um, you see populist politicians um, raising questions about the safety of, of vaccines and seemingly trying to make this into a, into a political issue. Um, and so I was curious about whether, whether, whether statistically um, you could see a relationship. And so um, here, if you see the main, main graph, it's from a, from a paper that was published a couple of years ago in the European Journal of Public Health, but basically all I'm doing, it's very simple, um, very simple correlations, but um, looking whether there was an association between on the one hand, the um, proportion of people who voted for populist parties in the European elections in 2016, and taking data from Heidi's vaccine confidence project. So people who agreed that vaccines are, um, agree with the statement that vaccines were important or effective um, or safe. And in each of those cases, you saw a very um, clear 
association between um, populist voting and um, increased vaccine hesitancy. So if you look at the bottom left hand corner of the of the graph, um, countries like Portugal and Belgium, you have very low levels of support for populist parties. And you also seem to have a lot of trust for uh, trust in vaccines. Whereas if you look towards the top right corner of the graph, you have countries like Italy far out there, but also France and Greece, where support for populist politicians and political parties is very high. And also um, vaccine confidence is, is very low. Um, so these are just um, cross, this is, this is national level data, but even if we look at individual level data, there's quite a lot of evidence that this, this, there is something, something going on. Um, I helped the Guardian um, analyze some, some, some data a couple of years ago as well um, from a survey conducted by YouGov. And this showed that the um, proportion um, of conservative voters and Labour Party voters in the UK who believed um, rumors about the government hiding information about vaccine vaccines, dangerous side effects. Um, about 10% of conservative and Labour voters um, believe these conspiracy theories, whereas UKIP as it was, um, about a third of UKIP voters believe these conspiracy theories. And you see a similar relationship in other countries as well. So the most startling one was 12% of, Macri, Mac, of Emmanuel Macron voters um, in the last presidential election believe conspiracy theories about vaccines compared with 44% of Marine Le Pen voters. Um, so there seems to be something, something going on there. There seems to be a link between political populism on the one hand and um, attitudes to vaccines on, on the other. And I think to understand this, we have to think about what populism in politics really is. And um, a key characteristic is the, this kind of anti-establishment rhetoric and the distrust in elites and experts. So it seems to be the case that um, this popular sentiment manifests in politics as hostility and distrust towards the center left and the center right politicians who dominated politics in Western Europe for a long, long time, as well as the financial and interest in the media who enabled this mainstream um, political, political um, these mainstream political parties and politicians. Um, and in the sphere of public health, this sentiment seems to manifest itself as distrust towards doctors, towards public health authorities and pharmaceutical companies that promote, promote vaccines. So um, exactly as Heidi says, this seems to be an issue of, of, of trust that transcends public health, transcends vaccines and has a really much deeper um, social, political and probably economic, economic route. Um, so just moving on to the, the next slide, and um, as, as Heidi says, you know, this is something that isn't, isn't new. We've seen, this, um, we've seen this before with the smallpox vaccine in the, in the late 19th century, and we've seen, um, we've seen kind of rumors about public health crisis ever since, um, or at least the Black Death, when there was all sorts of all sorts of terrible rumors, the, the, the most shocking of which was that Jewish communities in Central Europe were poisoning, poisoning wells. Um, and so, although certainly it's important to look at the role of social media and the role of the internet and the way that that has changed um, the manner in which we access information, the manner in which we communicate with, with one another, it's also important to try to understand what this underlying um, underlying um, driver of, of kind of rumors about public health, rumors about vaccines really, really is. And I think historically there's, there's a big difference as well. Um, if we think of the, the Black Death, people then lived in what we, what, what um, Max Weber calls a uh, um, enchanted garden. So people didn't understand how, how diseases were transmitted. Um, People thought they were the result of witchcraft or God's will or anything, anything like that. And um, today in the 21st century, there's um, an enormous amount of evidence that vaccines are safe and effective, or at least, um, at least um, 
vaccines are um, the benefits of vaccines are much 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 bigger than any any risks um, and so there does seem to be something something different going going on there um, Claire I've lost track of I've lost track of time but how, how much longer do I do I have now no you're fine no you're okay fine. that's 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 good so um, let's yeah so I think it's I think it's interesting to think about the broader social trends that um, that help to explain what's going on with vaccine hesitancy. Um, you know, if we think back to the 1960s, this is probably when the faith in science um, seems to have, have peaked. Um, it's an era that the late Mark Fisher refers to as popular modernism. And although he's talking about culture, I think it also applies quite well to um, attitudes towards science and society. So in advanced capitalist countries, certainly, this was a time of broad-based economic growth, um, rapid expansion of the welfare state, and really big technological advances. Um, and probably the best example of this is the landing on the moon in 1969. So um, many people had reason then to believe that the world was getting better and um, could get even better, and that science and medical science would play a crucial role in this. So there was this really strong um, support for, for science. But uh, this, this faith in science has gradually been eroded um, over the last 40, 50 years. And this began in academia with quite um, well-founded criticisms of science and the scientific methods by people like Bruno, Bruno Latour. Um, but it seems to have given way and enabled more extreme and more uninformed skepticism towards science um, among a much broader proportion of the population. And so vaccine hesitancy, as well as climate change denial, and um, even flat earthers seem to be a manifestation of this phenomenon. Um, and it seems to be something to do with a, a kind of re-enchantment of society. So significant portions of the population in um, late modern society seem to have sought meaning in their lives by turning their back on the scientific mainstream and engaging in anything from spiritualism to conspiracy theories. Uh, so just to conclude and to think about what is to be to be done, um, I think it's it's important to be humble and to try to understand why sections of the population have become increasingly skeptical towards elites and experts, whether it's um, vaccine hesitancy or political populism. Um, as this is an academic seminar, probably lots of us will believe that people that voted for Brexit or people that voted for Trump, um, they, were, they were misguided or at least that their, um, their, their votes would be counterproductive in the sense that they wouldn't help those people that, that voted for them. And it's very much the same with vaccines as well. Um, you know, the fact that vaccine hesitancy seems to be highest among ethnic minority groups in this, in this country at least. Um, and ethnic minority groups are those that are worst affected both, both in biomedical terms, but also in economic terms by the, um, by the current pandemic. It's a, real, it's a real tragedy and it really kind of um, really underlines how um, counterproductive vaccine hesitancy can, can be. But I think, you know, there are reasons why people don't, um, don't trust vaccine. Um, there are reasons why people don't trust pharmaceutical companies. Um, and there's a litany of examples of pharmaceutical companies behaving badly. And, you know, we can look, for example, at Purdue Pharma and what they, what they, this is a matter of record now and they've paid enormous amounts of compensation in the US for promoting opioids. Um, and the same with the state. Um, there are good reasons for people to believe that the state doesn't have their best interests at heart. Um, there are lots of people who have failed to, um, their lives haven't improved over the last 20 or 30 years. And, you know, even before COVID, if we looked at life expectancy in the UK or in the US, we saw that it was stalling uh, or even falling. And certainly in the UK, there's evidence to show that that was a result of austerity. Um, so I think it's, it's important to remember that both democracy um, or liberal democracy and global health are facing populist backlashes because they're embedded in a system of um, largely unregulated capitalism that seeks to enrich and embolden a small elite at the expense of the, the general population. So um, 
although suspicion about vaccines is, is misguided and um, might have a disastrous effect on individuals, but also on society, you can, there is, um, you know, one can, one can empathize with um, people and understand why they, why they are suspicious. And I guess our role is to really try to counter that and to, um, to really counter those suspicions. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That was, that was really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, and I guess I'll, I'm just gonna take Chair's prerogative before we open up for questions, because I know there's some questions coming into the chat. So I guess I have my first question for Heidi. Now, you showed us a lot of very visual, powerful visuals around this kind of anti-vaccine, particularly the New Zealand father kind of thing. So what, what are these groups aiming for? There, it seems like there's a, you know, these are very expensive um, adverts that they're putting out there. Is there a wider political agenda or is it simply to stop people to question, to mistrust in a vaccine? Like, are you, can you expand a little bit more on that? Well, I think that um, the motives vary. Um, I, I, I mean, one of the things that a lot of the philosophical and psychological literature, which is really uh, done the most in the in terms of defining trust and what define what characterizes it, and the two key things that define trust are um, your trust in the ability or competence of an individual or institution, and their motives, your perception of their motives. If they feel like, um, getting back to Jonathan's point about industry. Um, if you feel like their primary motive is to make money, um, that already reduces trust. Um, and in the case of China, there were situations when they moved from a more communist regime, well, which is still politically present, but there was this emerging mix of, of capitalism um, and doctors started charging. There were actually some doctors killed by their patients because all of a sudden they, they had a different anxiety that they didn't really care about them as people that they wanted to make money. Um, and, and that kind of can be quite a deep um, anger. Um, so I think in some, one of the things we shouldn't forget for a minute that while there are some um, who are propagating what's now called disinformation and the distinction between dis and miss is when it's um, intentionally intended to divide and polarize society for political agendas versus um, misinformation, which may be accidental, actually. People don't know and they're uh, sharing it around. But it all, and also we shouldn't forget that people deeply believe what they're talking about. They're not trying to, you know, make you an anti-vaccine. They resent that label, actually. Mm -hmm. But the people who are saying, um, you know, posing these risks are trying to say, don't believe everything you read. They haven't been telling us the truth. Look into it, provoke, question. And I, in my book, I say that, um, you know, in the enlightenment, uh, religion was the dogma and science was the liberator. And that's what freed you from the restrictions and constraints of religious dogma. Today, in my view, science has become the new dogma. Mm. Science said, therefore you do. Mm. Wow. Thank you for that. Okay, Jonathan, my question to you. Uh, you mentioned two kind of groups. You mentioned this kind of uh, the political right and the populace, and you also mentioned ethnic minorities. Now, is there a difference in the beliefs around vaccines that create the same outcome regarding hesitancy? Yeah, I mean, I think, as Heidi's been saying for, for, for a long time and other, other researchers, um, you know, there's not just one driver of, of vaccine hesitancy. Um, you know, the, the, the search for one single explanation for why people why people don't trust vaccines. It just, um, you know, it's a, it's a false errand, I, I guess. So there's, there's many different groups, um, I imagine, who are, who are um, 
open to misinformation, who are um, predisposed to distrust in distrust uh, public health authorities or pharmaceutical companies, but um, the, the, these groups aren't aren't all from the same from the same backgrounds, and you know um, one can certainly certainly understand why um, in this country or in the U.S. there would be higher levels of distrust of the state um, among ethnic minorities. Um, you know, there's 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 all sorts of very good reasons for for that, and um, you know, it's totally totally understandable. And I think you know. Um, the drivers of support for, um, for if we call them right-wing populist parties. Um, again, that's complex, but I think there's been research in political science that has shown that these are people that often feel um, economically marginalized by globalization, um, disenfranchised by mainstream politics. Um, they feel um, as if uh, migration has, has um, undermine their way of life or their culture. Um, so although, you know, ethnic minorities on the one hand and supporters of right-wing populists might seem at first face to be, um, you know, total po polar opposites, and in many ways they are, they are um, I guess they're both people on the margins of, of, of society and people that feel um, left out, left out, and therefore this does help us to explain um, why there why there would be feelings of, of distrust towards elites and experts. Okay, thank you. I know there's some um, over to you, Goon, for some of the questions in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we first have a, uh, a question from Kelly for Heidi. She asks, can Heidi share what she thinks is leading to the gradual increases in vaccine confidence across all groups in the UK of late and what she thinks the impact of non-conspiracy theory-based concerns such as blood clots will have? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't say it's declining across everywhere in terms of confidence. In fact, in the context of Europe, um, the UK is one of the higher confident uh, countries in terms of vaccines more broadly. Um, there are minority groups, um, and we see it's not just about minorities, it's also a class issue. There's a, there's a gap between confidence in the higher uh, educated white population and the low um, the low income white population. It's not, the gap is not as different as it is again with uh, black Asian minority communities, but that's where you see the difference. Um, there's another group that kind of um, is much more of the pro nature. Uh, there are some groups of mothers who have come to talk to me about this. They just, they have, they've chose a different lifestyle. It's about a value. It's about, you know, home birth. It's about vegan, uh, gluten-free, it's about um, a mix of things, uh, no more contraceptives, only rhythm method, uh, and a vaccine-free childhood. It fits into a bigger picture and a lifestyle that uh, misinformation is not going to fix. That's a value system that they've chosen. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, then we have a question from Katie Tapper. She says, fascinating talks. I was wondering if Jonathan could say more about possible casual um, causal relation between trust slash populism and hesitancy and links with social inequalities. Could the latter explain the link or can populism directly influence hesitancy? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Katie. That's a really great, really great question. And um, no, I think you certainly get to, uh, there's certainly an important point there that uh, you know, I wouldn't argue it's a direct causal causal relationship between a populist politician saying something and um, voters believing it, and and um, that kind of manifesting itself in their attitudes towards vaccines. Um, you know, I guess there's some kind of confounding variable which is very hard to verify and measure, and so I haven't been able to demonstrate it quantitatively. But um, something that you know, you might call call a broader kind of distrust um, in society or a broader kind of populist populist sentiment. So I would say that that's more likely a confounding 
variable that kind of leads into both. Um, if you have that, that underlying distrust that Heidi, Heidi referred to, then that means that you're much more likely A, to vote for, um, to vote for political parties outside of the mainstream and also to um, not necessarily trust the scientific mainstream on, on, um, on the importance or the safety or the effectiveness of, of vaccines. So there seems to be this, this um, underlying sentiment that, that, that explains that. And I think, as I said, as I said in my last response, and as Heidi, Heidi said, this sentiment can, um, this sentiment is, is common among all sorts of groups, um, you know, on the right and the, and the left um, with, with otherwise very different political um, outlooks or outlooks on, on life. But the, the one thing that they seem to have in common is that they're, they're kind of on the margins of, of society and have reasons to distrust the mainstream. Okay, that's great. Um, I have a, I have a couple more questions. Um, the first one's for Heidi. Look, these, you know, large pharma, they know about this vaccine hesitancy. What are they doing about it? You know, it seems like they're just contributing to it, but there must be, um, you know, they've got sufficient funds to address some of these concerns. Can you take us a bit through your kind of insider knowledge about what happens? Well, um, they want to do something because it affects their business aside from their their sense of moral responsibility here um, but they're not necessarily the best messengers mm -hmm. um, not I, I would say more bluntly they are not the best messengers mm -hmm. um, so the, the the vaccine confidence project um, full uh, transparency uh, does have some research grants from um, three different companies uh, I was extremely hesitant to cross cross the black water as they say for a number of years but then I felt like well if we don't collaborate with them um, it's not going to help either it's going to alienate it so we uh, have research grants with uh, GSK and that's a, a 15 country study on a willingness to accept vaccines during pregnancy around the world uh, with J and J on, on uh, COVID, um, basically compliance with measures more broadly, including vaccines. And with Merck, uh, we're about to roll out a, a big study on willingness and hesitancy uh, among healthcare professionals, which is a growing area of concern around their hesitancy, including around COVID. So I think where they can and should uh, fund is on research to inform the kind of needed uh, guidance, but that that commun those communication and engagement strategies should not be done. I don't think by the companies themselves, but by you know frontline programs or um, UNICEF or some of these frontline groups, uh, and we're kind of a translational um, body that generates the evidence and then hands off. I think you need a kind of shared, that, that's where partnerships are, are important, I think. Okay, thank you. And, and Jonathan, this, this tweet from, from Donald Trump, I mean, that just started this, opened up the floodgates of it's perfectly acceptable in the US to, to you know, to not go, to not vaccinate your child, essentially, because it, it's perfectly acceptable to believe in autism. He believes in it. Now, how do you like we have I would say in the US they're probably very ineffective at addressing that but that's a clear link between populist leader explicit message change in behavior is that the kind of thing that you've been looking at I haven't been looking at it but it's a yeah it's a it's an interesting issue when we think about communication because you know I like to somehow think of the analogy as as um the scientific mainstream fighting a, a guerrilla war in many respects. You know, we, um, you know, we have an obligation to stick to the truth, whereas the people, um, you know, kind of someone like like Trump, populist politicians, um, don't don't have have that same kind of um, that same um, inkling as as we do. And and also, I think kind of public health authorities have have typically used you know very traditional methods to 
get across information about about vaccines in a very um, traditional idea that if you if you explain to people about the facts, they'll change their uh, opinion and and you know kind of mm -hmm. the science about science communication is showing that that doesn't that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily work in many ways. That can be that can be counter counterproductive and. Um, as Heidi pointed out in her talk, there's there's been some really great um, efforts by by young young medics to use um, social media in the same kind of channels that um, people people spreading misinformation or disinformation about 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 vaccines. Um, and this is this is fantastic because I I guess that's you know that's one of the ways to really really um, be more agile um, in our response to to um, changing attitudes towards vaccines. Okay, thank you. And I know, Heidi, I know you have to go. So I'm gonna ask you um, for just a couple summary points. What do you want us to take away from this? Well, I think my first one is think before you share. <laughs> um, um, there's a lot of um, murky information out there that's very nicely dressed up to look very credible. Um, and I, I would really double check, triple check um, things that, uh, particularly pieces of information that if they can influence people's behavior the wrong way, you don't wanna feel responsible. Um, I know it's quite uh, challenging in the current environment where we're constantly getting pieces of misinformation, but um, just, I, I would slow down on the sharing unless you're pretty confident that it's right. Um, I think the other thing I would say is don't judge. Uh, people have their reasons for hesitating or refusing vaccines. And some of them, frankly, are quite legitimate. You may not agree with them, but have a listen, at least hear them out. And you may, that might, that may be it. You may just listen. But I think that um, one, of the re one of the things that's created a bigger divide and polarization is this finger wagging, judging, calling people of questions idiots, or um, I mean, uh, one of this group of parents brought a, a dossier of testimonies and clippings from newspapers and interviews and clinics where the kind of feelings that I, I don't blame them for having said, we're not, we don't want any part of these vaccines if this is the way. We're not even allowed to ask questions. Those are my kind of final thoughts. <laughs> uh, well, Heidi Larson, thank you very much. I know you have to go. And Jonathan, I hope it's okay. There's a couple questions in the chat that we'll ask you and then we're gonna wrap yeah. up. Thank you very much. Cheers. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try them. They might not be um, ones that I can answer because they might be related to, to Heidi, but I, I can, I can give it a go. Um, can you take us through some of this? Um, uh, Francesca had a question about, um, in your opinion, what vaccines specifically uh, elicit the most sort of distrust? And are groups that mistrust a vaccine, are they susceptible to this must trust going across other interventions or is it only related to the vaccines? I've got that right, Francesca. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to read the question again. Could I please? Oh, why do vaccines specifically take the spotlight in terms of distrust against against science? Um, I think there's a couple of there's a couple of good reasons. Um, I mean, one um, one is just ever since. I mean, Heidi talked about the um, the response to smallpox vaccines in the 19th century. And this wasn't so much against the vaccine, it was against, um, it was against the government making these vaccines mandatory. And, um, you know, vaccines work on an individual level. Um, very simply, you're exposed to an antigen and your body produces antibodies, which is fantastic, but they also work on a community level. And herd immunity has had a really bad, um, bad press the last, the last year, but um, you know, with regard to vaccines, the idea is that when a certain number of proportion of the population are vaccinated, there's too few um, people um, in the population who are unvaccinated to um, to um, 
for outbreaks to occur. And, and so this is great because it helps protect people who can't be, who can't be vaccinated, uh, young children, for example, or people with um, particular, particular um, health, health problems related to their immune system. Um, but this, this issue of um, mandatory vaccines has time and time again really upset people and really upset um, certain certain politicians. And it gets to, I guess, a, um, a really fundamental issue in political philosophy with regard to the um, with regard to the right of the state to intervene in the life of private individuals and their and their families. Um, so I think there's something to do with vaccines um, being such big big programs, often state mandated programs, and if not state mandated, then at least, um, you know, we see with COVID there being a lot of pressure, um, people, pressure pressure for people to get vaccinated and discussions in this country about vaccine passports and, and things like, and things like this. So I think that's one, that's one big, big reason. Um, I think even, even if we think, you know, about, about the idea of, um, of, you know, kind of, it's, it's, it's strange with vaccines because eliciting an immune response is the most, the most natural thing, really, um, um, exposing someone to an antigen so they produce an immune response. And that's why I started off with that slide about, you know, do we live in the age of microbes still? Because we're coming across bacteria and viruses every day and immune responses are, 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 are occurring. Um, but some, something in the way that science has been, the science has been communicated um, has allowed vaccines to be presented as something that's un, unnatural, that's that's being unnaturally introduced to the to the body, um, and there are there are reasons for that. You know, people look at the various ingredients and stabilizers in vaccines, um, and and raise concerns about about that, specifically things like like mercury. Um, but I think I think because vaccines are by their nature tend to be mass programs that are supported by the state, I think that that really riles people that are suspicious to, towards the state. Okay, that's great, thank you. And I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna ask you the same as I did to Heidi. What are your kind of takeaway messages for us? What do you want us to think about after this uh, webinar? Yeah, I think the main point is just to remember this isn't just about vaccines. This is a um, much bigger societal issue. Um, you know, the fact that vaccines have produced such brilliant outcomes over the last hundred odd years and people are still resentful, um, people are still distrustful towards them, um, should, be a, should be a red flag. Um, it, it, it should kind of, um, it should really concern us because th these are people who are, are rejecting the status quo, rejecting the way that society has been has been managed over the last 20, 20, 30 years. This is a kind of, um, it's, it's a cry by, um, it's a cry from people who, who, who are marginalized and who feel left out of society. So I think, you know, COVID in several respects has, has underlined um, just, how, um, just how obscene inequalities are in, in this country, just how obscene inequalities are between this country and and other countries and you know that might not be a surprise to us as people who are interested in in um development but i think it's it's a really um it's a really important kind of um thing to remember that if we live in a unhealthy society um one where there's lots of inequality one where there's lots of people who don't feel don't feel like they they belong um then there'll be all sorts of unhealthy unhealthy kind of things happening like um like you know kind of pandemics of emerging pandemics um and um vaccine vaccine hesitancy so i think you know um it should be a wake-up call to really deal with these these issues related to inequality within this country but also inequality between countries Jonathan, that's a great point to end on. Thank you so much for bringing that to the fore. I want to thank you for being a brilliant panelist. And I want to also thank our audience today for, for their great questions and participating in this webinar. And please check our website for webinars in the future. Thank you so much. And I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Gun, And thank you, everyone, for turning up and listening to us. <laughs> All right.
<laughs> All right. Bye -bye.